Abemus Vice Presidentum. President Trump has selected his running mate, and it is, drumroll please, Senator J.D. Vance from Ohio. Many people have only heard of J.D. Vance recently. Some people are probably only now hearing of him for the first time. I, however, have been following Senator Vance's career for a long time. I'm a longtime admirer of him, and I think he is absolutely the perfect VP pick, especially now. This pick tells us something extremely important about Trump 2024, which is that this campaign is all about the future. We will get into it along with further fallout from Saturday's assassination attempt on President Trump. I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. Welcome back to the show. The Mayflower Cigar Sampler is back in stock. I know that every time we get a new tranche of cigars in, they sell out very quickly. And then the first item to go is that eight cigar sampler of every regular production Vitola that we have. And it makes a great giftable and it's great just to have for yourself and to try it. So just letting you know, word to the wise, because I'm sure it'll sell out fast again. President Biden, after calling Trump Hitler for eight years and saying that he represents an existential threat to democracy, uh, Biden and the Democrats uh, call for unity and lowering the temperature, which I, I thought was disingenuous from the start. Uh, well, it, it really appears to be disingenuous as uh, libs, up to and including big Hollywood stars, uh, are, are now urging future assassins not to miss, like, like Saturday's assassin, uh, Actually, didn't. He actually did hit President Trump, and he, he hit multiple other people. Uh, we'll get into all of that. First, I want to tell you about American Financing. Go to AmericanFinancing.net. You work hard to support yourself and your family, but it may seem as though you are taking a step back every month instead of moving forward. When the bills are higher than what you bring in every month, you have to swipe that credit card to cover the difference, and the debt keeps adding up. But if you own a home, my friends at American Financing can help you break free from that cycle. American Financing is saving people just like you an average of $854 a month. Think about what you could do with an extra $800 every month without having to worry about those minimum monthly payments. It costs nothing to find out how much you can save. All it takes is a quick call to American Financing. And if you start today, you may be able to delay two mortgage payments. Call American Financing today and start your journey toward being credit card debt-free. Call 800 685 5696. That is 800 685 5696. Or visit AmericanFinancing.net. That is AmericanFinancing.net, NMLS 182334, NMLSConsumerAccess.org. JD Vance, Trump Vance 2024. Uh, Trump doesn't even really need to change the yard signs. This might have been a cost saving move because you can just take the Trump Pence yard sign. You can cut out the first two letters, replace PE with VA, and then you've got it. Trump Vance 2024. I think this is a really great pick. There were a number of people who were who were discussed as potential VP picks who they ended up, you know, a lot of them didn't quite make the short list. And but I've said for a long, long time I thought JD Vance would be an excellent choice. Here's what President Trump said. After lengthy deliberation and thought and considering the tremendous talents of many others, I've decided that the person best suited to assume the position of Vice President of the United States is Senator J.D. Vance of the great state of Ohio. J.D. honorably served our country in the Marine Corps, graduated from Ohio State University in two years, summa cum laude, and is a Yale Law School graduate where he was editor of the Yale Law Journal and president of the Yale Law Veterans Association. J.D.'s book, Hillbilly Elegy, became a major bestseller and movie as a champion of the hardworking men and women of our country. J.D. has had a very successful business career in technology and finance, and now during the campaign will be strongly focused on the people he fought so brilliantly for, the American workers and farmers in Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, Ohio, Minnesota, and far beyond. As vice president, J.D. will continue to fight for our Constitution, stand with our troops, and will do everything he can to help me make America great again. Congratulations to Senator J.D. Vance, his wife, Usha, uh, who also graduated from Yale Law School, and their three beautiful children, MAGA 2024. Others have noted that uh, picking JD is, is in some ways an insurance pick. Uh, presidents, even after the horrific attack on Saturday, presidents often 
want to pick at, at least we, what we would call impeachment insurance. Now you might say assassination insurance. Uh, someone that the liberals would really hate to have assume the role. I think J.D. Vance provides that. J.D. is solidly conservative. He is extremely intelligent. He knows what he believes. Uh, one, one knock on J.D. I've seen from critics is that, well, you know, he used to be more liberal or something. He used to, he used to be more opposed to Trump or something like that. Yeah, that's true of a lot of people. Uh, but, but J.D.'s uh, evolution of his thought and his, and his politics, I, I don't think is uh, just a convenience. I don't think it's something that, that is disingenuous or happened overnight because I've followed it somewhat closely. Of note, uh, J.D. is a convert to Catholicism. He has he explored many of the themes that have now come to dominate his uh, political vision and agenda in his best-selling memoir, Hillbilly Elegy. And so, obviously, the seeds there were planted for a long time. When one does have a religious conversion, which uh, had, had begun, it would seem, around 2015, 2016, and then he was, he was baptized and received into the Catholic Church in 2019. Uh, when one has a religious conversion, you know, all politics ultimately is religious, as Cardinal Manning reminds us. So that is that is going to lead you to rethink or clarify or deepen some of your political positions. So I think that in as much as J.D. has developed his views over the years, I, I think they've developed in a really beautiful direction, very solidly conservative direction. Uh, there are all sorts of factions to the Republican Party. You know, there's the squish faction, there's the pro chamber of commerce faction, there's the uh, bomb every country on earth faction. Those are kind of the neocons. There's the libertarian faction, which has great stuff to contribute, but is sometimes founded on uh, shaky principles and liberal principles. Sometimes can move left on certain issues, and you know, you get a hundred conservatives in a room, you're gonna you're gonna see them all disagree on something. Uh, J.D. seems very much in line with the ways that President Trump, I won't say has remade the Republican Party. I would say President Trump has restored the Republican Party in many ways to its roots. Don't forget, the Republican Party was founded on economic protection and say, you know, pr protecting American industry. Not to say we shouldn't trade with the rest of the world, but we've got to protect our own industry. We've got to re recognize that the economy is here so we have a flourishing country, not the other way around. The country isn't here for the economy. The people aren't here to serve the GDP number. It's the other way around. A strong economy is good for us, but it's good for us. You know, it's good for our political society. Good political societies have, have limits. Uh, restricting what has become now just total open borders and mass migration, that's, that's important to protecting American workers, encouraging the growth of American families, all of this kind of stuff, which a lot of the GOP neglects or undermines. Well, President Trump has made that a big focus of his uh, campaign going back to 2016. J.D. Vance has, has focused on those issues uh, tremendously. It was a big motivator behind his Ohio Senate run and his whole political vision going back to that memoir, which then became a big Hollywood movie. Um, I'm sure Hollywood wouldn't make that movie now. Uh, the question about Trump's VP pick was, is he going to pick a guy to be, to balance out the ticket? You know, is he going to pick someone, I don't know, pick a black guy just because he's black or pick a woman just because she's a woman, you know, a, a kind of uh, identity politics pick to balance out the ticket? Or was Trump going to pick a, just a kind of a wallflower you know, a really boring guy because Trump is so um, eccentric, because Trump is such a showman. He takes up so much attention. Is he going to pick someone who just, you know, blends in with the furniture to balance that out? Or is he going to pick an old guy, you know, an old guy so that uh, it's he's totally innocuous? Or is he going to pick someone like J.D. Vance? J.D. Vance is young, He's brilliant, but not, you know, it's not that he would ever upstage Trump. I don't think he would, he would do that at all, but he's, he's clearly brilliant. Uh, he has a strong political vision that is very much in line and could continue on the project that Trump is, is doing. And he's a candidate for 2028 or 2032 or whatever. He's young. He's, at, he's really at the beginning of his political career. He, he, he hasn't hit the peak yet. So it's, it's, a, it's a pick about legacy. When the libs tell you Trump's second term is just going to be all about revenge and settling old scores and, you know, just uh, mollifying his ego or something, I think a pick like this is exhibit A. No, that's not what Trump's doing. Trump is setting up a political vision that, that he intends to extend far beyond 2024, maybe into 2028, 2032, to solidify the restoration that he has brought in many ways to the GOP. Even if you don't like that language or you don't like Trump, you say, he's, well, he's changed the GOP from the party of George Bush or even the party of Milton Friedman or Reagan or whatever. Uh, 
what you would have to conclude, I think, even if you hated Donald Trump, is this is a guy who is, is oriented now toward the future and building a legacy. And I think that's, that's a good thing. Uh, meanwhile, how is the White House reacting to everything? How is the White House reacting to the assassination attempt on Saturday? You heard from Biden. He had that six-sentence statement written by some staffer. Then he came out, he made some brief remarks, said nothing. Then he came out, said some more nothing. But, but what he focused on was he said, we need to lower the temperature and we need to unite America. Biden obviously hasn't done that. And Biden has a big problem. Because Biden's entire campaign is premised on Trump's posing an existential threat to democracy akin to Adolf Hitler, whom Biden accuses Trump of admiring and channeling. So Corinne Jean-Pierre, president's spokesman, was asked today, hey, is Biden going to keep, in the wake of the assassination attempt on Donald Trump, Trump has part of his ear blown off and a Trump supporter was murdered in cold blood and two Trump supporters were critically injured at a rally. Is, is Biden going to lead the way in lowering the temperature and uniting America? Is he going to stop calling Trump an existential threat to the country? Here's Corinne Jumpier's answer. Are we going to continue to hear the president in official events or on the campaign trail use the phrase threat to democracy specifically? I want to be very clear. The president's always going to denounce violence, forcefully denounce it. He's always been against this throughout his career, throughout the last four years. We do not want to politicize this. It's unacceptable to do that. That's what the president has said. It is time to bring this country together, to bring American people together. That's what he wants to see. And so that's where I'm going to leave it. He wants to unite this country. And that is something that he's been saying since 2019. It would be really hard to do, though, if you're trying to make a shift away from what has been the the platform of this administration, of his campaign, in, in that the view is that Trump and the MAGA Republican agenda is a threat to democracy. So how do you get that message across while bringing the temperature down? How is that phrasing going to be replaced? Is it going to be replaced? Well, look, what I can say is this. We have our differences, and it's okay to have our differences. But you're saying it's not okay to have our differences. That This is the quandary for the Biden campaign. And this reporter very astutely pointed it out. Biden's campaign is not Trump and I have our differences. We both love America, but we have a very different vision for America. And I have a different economic agenda, a different different immigration agenda, different foreign policy agenda. We have our differences. We're going to hash it out in the democratic system. Biden's campaign says Trump poses an existential threat to democracy itself. The election of Donald Trump represents the end of America. Donald Trump is Hitler. That's not a, Hitler and I have our differences, you know, but we respect each other. And, you know, my opponent wants to completely destroy democracy, but we have our, that's not, that has not been the Biden campaign. But now there's a a quandary because Biden's rhetoric, Biden's campaign premise sets the stage to justify assassination. But now that someone tried and very, very nearly was successful in assassinating Donald Trump, the Biden campaign has to turn away from that kind of rhetoric. But that's the whole campaign. So so the the question for Biden right now, Corrine Jean-Pierre can't answer it. She's dancing around it. She's got no answer. Joe Biden would have no answer. No no Democrat has an answer. The, The option is admit that Donald Trump is not Hitler and admit that Donald Trump does not pose a, a threat to democracy and therefore abandon your campaign or continue to justify the assassination of Donald Trump. Those are the only two options. Stop campaigning, effectively concede the 2024 presidential race because you got nothing else, or continue to justify the assassination of Trump. Those are the only options. And if you if you asked me, if I were a gambling man, which one is it going to be? They're going to continue to justify the assassination of Trump. They have to, because he's not going to concede but they don't have any other issue to run on. This is why it was so insane when you you heard from Biden, you heard from AOC, you heard from all these top Democrats. Oh, I'm, I'm so grateful that President Trump is okay. I thought he was Hitler. You're grateful that Hitler's okay? You're glad, oh, I hope nothing bad happens to Hitler. Listen, Hitler and I have our differences. I thought Trump was an existential threat. I'm glad that the existential threat to our whole country is doing well? That doesn't make any sense. So what they're they're saying doesn't 
is completely senseless. They call this a senseless act of violence, the, the assassination attempt. It's a very sensible act of violence if you believe the premises that they established. The premises that they can't, they can't deny. So after, what, what's it been, 24 hours, 48 hours since the assassination attempt, Democrats are already going back to Trump is an existential threat to democracy. If Karine Jean-Pierre cannot say with 100% certainty, we will stop calling him a threat to democracy, we'll stop calling him Hitler, that means they're right back to justifying the assassination of President Trump, which is what they've been doing for years. Awful. We need to restore some balance to our country. I want to tell you about Balance of Nature. Go to balanceofnature.com, use promo code Knowles. Balance of Nature Fruits and Veggies is the most important and convenient way to get whole fruits and vegetables daily. If you, like me, are not having a totally balanced diet necessarily, this is one great way using an advanced cold vacuum process that encapsulates fruits and vegetables into whole food supplements without sacrificing their natural antioxidants. The capsules are completely void of additives, fillers, extracts, synthetics, pesticides, or added sugar. The only thing in balance of nature is fruit and veggie capsules or fruits and veggies. Imagine trying to eat 31 different fruits and vegetables every day. That sounds miserable and time-consuming. With Balance of Nature, there's never been an easier way to ensure you get your daily dose of fruits and vegetables. Go to balanceofnature.com. Use promo code Knowles, K-N-O-W-L-E-S, for 35% off your first order as a preferred customer. Plus, get a free bottle of fiber and spice. That is balanceofnature.com, promo code Knowles, K-N-O-W-L-E-S, balanceofnature.com, promo code Knowles. Did you try to tune into Morning Joe yesterday on MSNBC? You probably did not because you're a reasonable person. But some people, I guess, did. Some people watch that show. And they will not have found Morning Joe there. MSNBC made the decision to pull Morning Joe from the air on the Monday after the execution attempt, successful in that it killed people, not, not quite successful in that it only, it only pierced Donald Trump's ear and didn't succeed in, in killing him. MSNBC, one of its biggest shows, long-standing morning show, doesn't air that day? Why not? According to CNN, so it's not even a right-wing news source, a left-wing news source, a person familiar with the matter told CNN that the decision was made to avoid a scenario in which one of the show's stable of two dozen-plus guests might make an inappropriate comment on live television that could be used to assail the program and the network as a whole. What does it say about Morning Joe? that that's a concern, that the day after the biggest news story since September 11th, 2001, or the, or the Monday after that story, they couldn't even air the program because the executives knew that, that one of the hosts or one of the guests was going to say something so hideous, so vile, that it would imperil their whole network. What does that say about the show? What does that say about the caliber of the guests and the hosts? What does that say about the rhetoric from the left? This is one of the most mainstream news shows on the left, on one of the most mainstream left-wing networks. And they were so afraid that one of their guests or hosts would say something so vile and hideous that could destroy the whole network. I thought all the nasty political rhetoric was coming from the right. It seems to be coming primarily, if not exclusively, from the left. And we know this. We saw, we saw major left-wing figures justifying the assassination attempt, mocking it, laughing about it. Keith Olbermann, former, former host on MSNBC for that matter, saying all sorts of vile things about Trump. Still saying he's still Hitler. He's still Hitler. Still justifying him. Tenacious D. You remember Tenacious D? It's this rock band with Jack Black, the movie star, and some other guy, whoever the, whoever the other non-Jack Black guy is. They, they were just doing a show right as the news breaks of the assassination attempt on Trump. Here's what they had to say on stage before a ton of people. <laughs> Don't miss Trump next time. <laughs> Thank you. you. So you hear some people in the crowd saying, whoa, whoa, but a lot of people laughing, clapping, applauding, and this is what they think. This is, this is, Jack Black is not some fringe figure. He's a big movie star. I mean, he's not in much lately, but he just, he just showed up to be a big fundraiser and surrogate for the Biden campaign just weeks ago. Took a picture in a big Biden t-shirt and American flag overalls. That's what they think. How is it? How do you come to that conclusion? Because you don't, you don't see the right celebrate when our opponents are killed or nearly killed or even die of natural causes. 
Why not? The reason that I don't celebrate when my political opponents die or are injured or are nearly assassinated is not because I like them a lot. I feel some human solidarity with them. I think they're before the grace of God go I. I am called to love my neighbors and to pray for my enemies. And the reason that I don't wish death upon them or celebrate uh, when something bad happens to them is, is one, because if I have hatred for my neighbor, I've committed murder in my heart, according to my Lord, and also because I dread the loss of heaven and the pains of hell, and I don't want to offend uh, God, who is all good and deserving of all my love. That's why. And so if you don't believe that stuff, if you don't believe in God, as many, if not most liberals don't, if you don't really believe in a moral order, not an objective moral order, you, maybe you think, I don't know, morals are just something we all came up with. We all, in the early evolution, we all just came up with it to kind of survive. If you don't, really, if you don't believe it's real, if you don't believe in an afterlife, if you don't believe in the immortality of the soul, if you don't believe in the reality of things like justice, then why wouldn't you wish death on your enemies? Why, if, if, all that, if all that really matters is just these uh, that, you know, meat puppets are walking around with the illusion of love and truth and reason and you know, we're all going to just die and the, and the highest things in the world are just the, the political order, you know, the, the contingent history, the principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness that govern this, this uh, world in, in, in its fallenness. If that's all there is, then yeah, why wouldn't you? you, should, you of course you would celebrate the death of your enemies. And they do. So it's very difficult for them to unite, very difficult for them to lower the temperature. Because, because if, if, they're, if they're saying we all need to lower the temperature, the right has already done that. The right just generally does that. The right generally would like to unite and the right generally recognize it as an objective moral order. The left doesn't. They don't want to do it. So, so their, their platitudes about this to try to attract moderates months before a presidential campaign, they just ring hollow. It's so obviously disingenuous. Now, when you want to talk to people, you got to check out Pure Talk. Go to puretalk.com slash Knowles. You've heard me say for a long time that cell phone service with Pure Talk is half the cost of Verizon, ATT, or T-Mobile. You might be thinking, what's the catch? There's no way Pure Talk can offer unlimited talk, text, and plenty of data for just $20 a month. I say, just ask the thousands of other listeners who have already switched. They are loving America's most dependable 5G network. They love Pure Talk's U.S. customer service. They love their selection of premium phones, and they love the money that they're saving month to month. So what are you waiting for? It is time to start supporting companies that share your beliefs, like beliefs in creating American jobs, the belief that it's important to support our veterans. It is time to switch your cell phone service to Pure Talk. Plus, with no contract and a 30-day money-back guarantee, you have nothing to lose. Go to puretalk.com slash Knowles, Canada WLES, to upgrade your cell phone service to America's most dependable 5G network and save an extra 50% off your first month. 50, 50% off your first month. That is puretalk.com slash Knowles today. President Biden couldn't even get out his Oval Office address without a Freudian slip. He, he, the, the purpose of the Oval Office address after the assassination attempt was to say we need to lower the temperature, we need to unify, we need to resolve our differences at the ballot box. Here's what he said. But in America, we resolve our differences at the battle box. You know, that's how we do it, at the battle box, not with bullets. In America, we resolve our differences at the battle box. And then he repeats it, at the battle box. That is, I believe, what the psychologists call a Freudian slip. A Freudian slip where you say one thing but mean your mother, right? Is that what it is? Biden doesn't really know how to speak anymore because he has dementia, which they denied, but then it became clear at the presidential debate where Trump destroyed him. So then the Democrats were in complete crisis and it looked like there was no way to beat Trump other than to kill him. And then there was an attempt on Trump's life and he survived it, it would seem miraculously. Uh, and uh, so now they're they're trying to downplay everything, and they say, no, we're we're good Democrats, lowercase d. We just want to resolve our differences democratically, even though we're prosecuting our our opponents and we're trying to put a former president in jail for the first time, the top presidential candidate in jail for the first time. And hey, there might be an assassination attempt. We might even celebrate it, some of us. Uh, but but even when when Biden's trying to say that, he gets that slip in there at the battle box, because that's what they think. They, they don't think politics is a reasonable conversation where we persuade one another. They, they think it's all just uh, uh, about the irrational will. Whose irrational will is going to win out? Who's got a bigger club that he can bop the other guy in the head with? And so the address failed. 
Biden. It failed Biden on a couple of levels. It failed in that it didn't didn't really even seriously convey the message he wanted to say. He couldn't even get the words out right. And, and the words he got out actually were the opposite of, of, of the message he was trying to, to express. But, but it, it failed at a deeper level. Biden did not reassure Americans of anything. Biden got out there and he needed to convince people that he was the adult in the room, he was going to restore order, he was in command of his faculties. He didn't achieve any of those things. He, did, he wasn't even able to speak properly. So the Biden campaign is in complete disarray. There's a report to Axios now that a, a senior House Democrat has told Axios that, that a lot of Democrats on the Hill have just resigned themselves to a second Trump term. Now, there's a lot of time between now and November. And there's nothing, there's nothing that these people won't do to stop Trump. Because they say he's Hitler. They say he's an existential threat to the country. There's nothing they won't do. And, it, and now, speaking today, there's, there's nothing they haven't tried against him. So speaking of that attack, who's the shooter? What information do we have? As I mentioned on the show yesterday, we don't know very much about him. We know that he's 20. He, he is. He, he was 20 years old. We, it, it would appear that he was a registered Republican. That's what all the left-wing news networks are trying to point out. The thing that they don't want to say is that it, the only political donation he ever made, the only political activism he seems to have taken part in, is donating to Democrats, a progressive Democrat group. So that's kind of weird. Uh, why, why was he a registered Republican? And why did he donate exclusively to Democrats and progressives? I don't know. His dad apparently was a uh, registered, is a registered libertarian. The mother is a registered Democrat. Uh, who knows? Who knows? We, we now know that he had explosives in his home and in his car. And this doesn't, doesn't make a lot of sense. If he's crawling up on the roof and shooting at the president, he had to know that he, he was going to have his head blown off as soon as secret. You would think he would, he would have understood that he would have his head blown off the minute he started to get those rounds off. Some people are wondering why he didn't have his head blown off sooner, why it took so long for the Secret Service or local police to respond. But then why would he have explosives in his car if he, if he knew that he was going on a suicide mission? Very strange. Something even stranger has just turned up. The shooter... The would-be assassin, two years ago, appeared in a TV commercial for BlackRock, possibly the most powerful financial institution in the world. My name is Brian DeLalo. I teach AP and honors economics in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Financial well-being to me is knowing that I can be free to do the things that I love to do. I hope when I retire someday, they say, you know, that guy made this place a special place to come There's to school a kid. and gave as there much he as he could to help the community. There was him. This isn't some conspiracy theory. BlackRock acknowledges this. They've pulled the commercial down. BlackRock has $9.1 trillion in assets under management. When you take actual nation states out of the equation, when you take, I don't know, the Federal Reserve out of the equation, you're talking about basically the largest finance, financial institution in the world. What? So this is setting people, you know, the, everyone's pulling out the tinfoil hat now. What does it mean? How on, what? How is the would-be assassin who apparently doesn't have any social media, it's kind of hard to believe that in 2024, people don't have a, a trail on, on the internet. They don't know social media we can find. And these registered Republican, but he donates to Democrats. That's really weird. That doesn't really satisfy. It doesn't answer any political narrative. We don't need no manifesto, no, no nothing. What? And then he pops up in a glossy TV commercial two years ago for one of the most powerful and, you know, kind of has a reputation as a really swampy, politically involved financial institution with $9 trillion under him. What? Now, uh, I don't know. I don't know. No one really knows. A any would, uh, assassination, successful or unsuccessful of a president, I think legitimately should raise lots of questions about a conspiracy. It's not saying there was some conspiracy. Could have been acting alone, but you gotta, you got to investigate that, obviously. But I'm not convinced it had to be a conspiracy. I'm not convinced that this BlackRock commercial has to have some particular meaning. And, and here's why. Here's why. It gets to exactly what I was talking about on my show yesterday. The entire introduction of my show yesterday. A 15 to 20 degree turn of Donald Trump's head 
was the difference between him losing the top of his ear and him losing the back of his head. A, a 15 to 20 degree turn of Donald Trump's head at the precise moment that it occurred just before the, the round went off from the assassin's bullet or from the assassin's gun is the reason that Donald Trump is alive today. In, so improbable that, the, that his head would have turned that way is to seem impossible to people unless you recognize that the cosmos, this is what Christians would recognize, what religious people would recognize, the cosmos is so finely tuned to God's providence that when coincidences happen, a Christian would say, yes, of course. You know, it's, as, as a priest friend of mine points out, it's a wicked generation that, ignore, that, that, that seeks for signs and wonders, but it's a stupid generation that ignores signs and wonders. The, the Christian vision of the world is a semiotic vision of the world rich in symbols. Things mean something. And when coincidences pop up, you don't, you don't, you don't always need to find out their particular meaning. It's, it's a sign, as far as I'm concerned, that just, yeah, God, God exists. The universe is intelligible. There is a creator. and Creation implies a creator. It just from reason, just from nature, you can come to that conclusion. And it, that might just be what's happening here. If you, if you can chalk up Trump's turn of his head to the playing, uh, the, the playing out of God's providence. You could attribute this coincidence to that as well. I don't know. I just don't know. We don't really know very much. We don't know how this guy was allowed to get his rounds off, get up on that roof. Right now, local police are blaming the Secret Service. Secret Service are blaming the local police. Uh, there was an interview with a former Secret Service agent who, who made the obvious point even if local police had been tasked with securing the area outside of the security perimeter of the rally, even if local law enforcement did drop the ball, it is the responsibility of Secret Service to ensure that everything is going according to plan. Even if the Secret Service says, hey, local police, I want you to secure those buildings over there. It nevertheless is the responsibility of Secret Service to make sure that happens. The job of U.S. Secret Service is to protect the president. You show up to a small town of 12,000 people that has a handful of buildings of any size in it, and, and you're not going to go check those buildings when, according to reports, Secret Service knew these were security threats. You're just going to trust that to some almost certainly underfunded and understaffed local police department? Out of your mind, if you think that's acceptable. So ultimately, the buck stops with Secret Service. When are we going to hear from the Secret Service director? When are we going to see any accountability? As one source uh, for, for these reports added, just because it's outside the perimeter doesn't take it out of play for vulnerability. You've got to mitigate it in some fashion. Anthony Congelosi, who is former Secret Service agent, he now, he's now a professor at John Jay College in New York, he says, you don't surrender the discretion of what's supposed to be done to the local police. In other words, you guys have the outer perimeter, but you want to say, we need an officer on that roof. Not, that's your responsibility, do what you see fit. You don't entrust the, the safety of the president, of the former president, or the future president in this case, to local police department. It's so bizarre. Jim Cavanaugh, also in this report, is a retired ATF agent, points out, he says, the only way to stop that is you have a lot of people, you get there first, you, you command the high ground. This is basic and the Secret Service has done it for years successfully. So I'm really surprised that they did not have that high ground from which the shooter shot covered. That point is, the Secret Service has done this successfully for years. We haven't seen one of these attempts since the last really conservative president, actually, Ronald Reagan. Weird. Weird. How, how did that break down? Somebody is responsible. This is not, you know, oh, well, mistakes happen. Somebody, this is highly unusual. We, we have video of, of a crowd of people saying, look, there's a guy on the roof. Look at it. What's that guy doing on the roof? That guy's got a rifle. What, why isn't someone doing, why isn't someone pulling Trump off stage? Doesn't get pulled off stage from, at ever, really. But, but for minutes, this is going on. What happened? What broke down? Now, there's, in addition to this, there's an, this, this must be the biggest news week since September 11th, 2001. You have, the attempted nearly successful assassination of Donald Trump. You then have the Republican convention kicking off two days later. You then have the announcement of Trump's running mate, a major, very exciting announcement. Then you have news out of the judiciary that, that 
probably the the biggest case against Donald Trump in all of these four prosecutions, tr- Joe Biden trying to throw his, his political opponent in jail, that case gets dismissed. We'll get into that in just one moment. First, though, at The Daily Wire, we are all about action. The ticket is officially set. America's future is in our hands. Ultimately, it's in God's hands, but we need to cooperate with God. The Daily Wire is offering a 47% presidential discount in honor of the future 47th president of the United States, Donald Trump. Equip yourself with the facts and perspectives you will not get from the mainstream media. With your membership, you will get access to our entire lineup of shows, podcasts, in-depth investigative reporting, and live breaking news. No censorship, no pandering. This 47% off deal is a limited time offer for a crucial time in our nation's history. Go to dailywire.com slash subscribe. Join us in the fight and get 47% off your new annual membership now. My favorite comment on, oh, yesterday was from Nashville Preds fan 2562. It says, didn't Michael Knowles report last week that Joe Manchin wanted to wait for this weekend to say whether he wanted to support Joe Biden? What a big coincidence. So this is a weird one. This has been playing out in my head. I didn't mention it on the show, but I did play it. I thought it was the, the strangest clip of last week where Biden, uh, Manchin rather, was asked, this is a somewhat moderate Democrat senator from West Virginia and, and potential presidential candidate, was asked, do you still support Joe Biden or should he drop out? Manchin said, he didn't want to answer the question. He said, look, you know, I like Joe, support Joe. Uh, I think things are going to be a lot clearer after this weekend. So we're just going to wait and see for this weekend. And so in retrospect, in light of the assassination attempt, this seems really ominous. This seems really eerie. And people are asking, did Joe Manchin know about the assassination? And I want to be explicit about this. I don't. I don't think Joe Manchin knew about the assassination attempt on Trump. I don't. I don't think, you know, he was part of some plot. If anybody were to be part of a plot or a conspiracy, I don't think it'd be Joe Manchin. He's one of the last guys in Washington I would expect to be part of it. But it is odd in retrospect. In retrospect, it looks totally bizarre. So uh, we'll know more after this weekend. That's why I point out there are sometimes little coincidences, little winks in history in retrospect that can look very different from a different vantage. The uh, If you if you play back that the clip of when Trump is shot, he says, look at this. He said, I think those are his exact words. Look at this at the moment that we're all called to look. Then the head turns slightly and the bullet grazes him instead of blowing his brains out. Lots of there, there are no mere coincidences in the Christian view of the world. Doesn't mean everybody's up to some crazy conspiracy plot. The, the whole world is imbued with meaning. And we see that meaning played out in, in history, in retrospect. All right, if we have time, we'll get to the meaning of history. Actually, that's a story I want to get to, but I don't, I don't know if I'll have time today. That might just be a tease. I, I do want to turn to a, a major, uh, major news story, which is that Trump ha- has had his biggest case against him dismissed. Judge Aileen Cannon, district judge, uh, wrote a 93-page decision and said that the the Appointment of Jack Smith, the special counsel who's prosecuting the case against Trump, was, quote, unlawful. It was unlawful. It was unconditional. Uh, or, I'm sorry, rather, un- <laughs> unconstitutional. The clerk is directed to close the case. Attorney General Merrick Garland had appointed Smith back in 2022, and Trump's lawyers have been arguing that uh, he did not have the right to do that. He said, the appointments clause of the Constitution, quote, does not permit the attorney general to appoint without Senate confirmation, a private citizen and like-minded political ally to wield the prosecutorial power of the United States. As such, Jack Smith lacks, lacks the authority to prosecute this action. Now, this is different than, say, the appointment of a special counsel in the, or a special prosecutor in the Hunter Biden case. You know, Hunter Biden is being prosecuted for his lowest level crimes. This is uh, rather different. Because uh, in, in that case, uh, you had someone who was already working uh, with the DOJ. Uh, White, or Rice was already a U.S. attorney, the, the prosecutor in the Biden case. Smith was a private citizen at the time that he was appointed. And Trump's lawyers argued that, that uh, this was an illegitimate appointment, and, and the judge now agrees. So, so what's going to happen? Does that mean Trump's off the hook? No, it means that Jack Smith is going to appeal. This is going to go to an appellate court. And... But even if the appellate court rules in Smith's favor, even if it goes all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court, it means that this case is now pretty much for certain pushed until after the election. A major win for Trump. Really good move from Judge Cannon. Speaking of Trump victories, Don Jr., the president's son, just 
gave a masterclass in handling the hostile liberal establishment media from the Republican National Convention. Here is Don Jr. talking to MSNBC. What is that change going to look like, Don? What Practically, your father as president, I think you would even say, was a divisive figure. What's it going to look like in the second term? I don't think he was a divisive figure at all. I think the media created divisiveness around him. They lied about Russia, Russia collusion. They said he was a traitor. They went after him in every which way is possible. If the media actually starts being an honest broker, talking about the things that he did, the prosperity he brought, the peace deals that he signed around the world, rather than the disaster that we're living right now, I think you do everyone in the country a big favor. I know immigration is important to him. I covered the family separation crisis closely. Will we continue to see policies like separating 5,000 children deliberately from their parents? You mean the Obama administration? Administration. You know they didn't do that, sir. Okay. Sure. Will there be a second family separation policy? It's MSDNC, so I expect nothing less from you clowns. Even even today, even 48 hours later, you couldn't wait. You couldn't wait with your lies and with your nonsense. So just get out of here. Love it. Love it. It's a master class. You look at how he holds himself. He comports himself very well, standing up straight. And first what he does is politely and succinctly rips apart the liberal reporter's nonsense. Does a very good job at that. And then the liberal reporter, he doesn't want to hear it, so he pulls the microphone and he says, are you, are you talking about the Obama era policies? The Obama era policies of putting kids in cages or whatever nonsense you're talking about? The reporter pulls the microphone away. He doesn't want Don Jr. talking about that. Then the reporter just doubles down on his nonsense and Don Jr. recognizes this guy is immune to logic and reason. You're not, you're not really going to convince the liberal reporter. What you want to do is embarrass the liberal reporter for having his facts wrong. You want to persuade the public, who maybe the people on the fence who are watching the liberal reporter's newscast, but you say your piece. And then when, when the reporter just you know, shoves his fingers in his ears and says, la, 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 you say, okay. Then you instruct the liberal reporter to go pound sand, which is what Don Jr. did. He's asked a question. He gives a very good answer to the question. The reporter keeps pushing him. He observes the hypocrisy in the reporter's rhetoric. The reporter then, you know, keeps trying to dig in and he says, okay, I've made my point. You're you're not going to be persuaded. You know, I got two words for you and they're not happy birthday. Bye-bye. And this is not bye-bye either. And that's it. Beautiful, beautiful masterclass. Something uh, we all ought to keep in mind for our debates. Now, speaking of the sons of presidents, there's a report. This is a really worrying, a lot of worrying reports recently. There's a report out that, uh, according to the Daily Beast, Joe Biden's acting chief of staff right now, the guy who's actually controlling access to the president and is directing the president's decisions, is Hunter Biden, a former crackhead, a crook who's sold his father's influence in the government all over the world to some of the worst people on earth. According to this report from the Daily Beast, this is a left-wing outlet, Joe's family is standing with him, his wife, Jill, and sister, Valerie, who Democrats relied upon to provide wise counsel, not just cheerleading. His son, Hunter, has been seen at the White House so much lately that one well-connected lawyer, lobbyist, Democrat, dubbed him the acting chief of staff. He's the gatekeeper. He's the one who's bucking up his dad, which would explain a lot. That would explain a lot of uh, Joe Biden's failures. Uh, but but regardless, you see the, the, the conclusion from this story is He's keeping that tight circle around him. He's surrounding himself with family and the very, very close allies. And so Obama wants him out. Joe doesn't give a damn. The Clintons want him out. Nancy Pelosi, Schumer, they all want him out. What does Joe Biden care? What does Joe Biden have to gain by getting out of the race? What does he have to lose by staying in the race? Nothing, nothing. And what's the campaign going to be? All Joe Biden's campaign is, is Trump is Hitler and he's going to destroy our country. And that's going to justify getting Trump killed. And they tried to kill Trump. Some guy in Pennsylvania tried to kill Trump based on the premises established by the leading Democrats, including Joe Biden. So now Joe Biden can't even campaign on that. He can try. He's going to continue to try. It's going to rub a lot of people the wrong way. It's going to rub a lot of moderates and independents the wrong way. Because they're going to see the consequences of that kind of rhetoric, of those premises. So he's got nothing. Okay. Speaking of ancient things, I'm glad I did get to this. We're talking about history. You know, you, you look back at history, your personal history, the history of your community, of your country, and things start to make sense. They don't, they don't always make sense at the time. Things happen. You pull your hair out. Why is this happening? But, but 
they start to make sense looking back. And, and God's providence, the, the intelligibility, which Christians believe in, you know, liberals don't necessarily believe in it. They have their own progressive utopias, actually, where that, that comes up with a kind of uh, 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 an anti-narrative, you know, a, a di- very different kind of narrative. But, but Christians believe, actually, we, things don't always seem to make sense in the short run, but in, in the arc of history, the story that God wants to tell is unfolding as he wishes. Uh, th- there's a story, uh, a news report that's just come out from the Daily Mail. Archaeologists find more evidence of Bible story about Moses leading his people to the promised land 3,200 years ago. So without getting too much into the weeds of the story, just, there's, there's more evidence coming out from the Israeli Antiques Authority or Antiquities Authority that uh, the story of the Exodus told in the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, really did happen. It literally happened in history, which does not surprise me at all. There, there, there are four layers of meaning. You want to really go back in time. The, the scholastics in the Middle Ages, the, the height of our civilization, they understood that there are four layers of meaning to a text. There's the literal meaning. There is the typological meaning, the allegorical meaning. There's the moral meaning. And there's the anagogical meaning, meaning the, the meaning from the perspective of, of eternity, of the end times. So how does this play out? Well, the, the, a great example of this, Dante actually lays this out in a famous letter to his patron, Con Grande de la Scala. He, he, he points to the book of Exodus and he said, this is a great example of the, the four layers of meaning. What's the literal story of the book of Exodus? Moses leads the Israelites from Egypt into the promised land. What is the typological meaning of the figurative meaning of this is, is the redemption won for us by Christ. That's what that, that's what that figures, prefigures. What's the, what's the moral meaning? You know, like the moral of the story, the moral meaning is that the struggle that each of us undergoes uh, from, from the misery of sin to the status of grace. And then what's the anagogical meaning? It's the, it's the taking, and this is Dante's words, the taking of the blessed soul from the slavery of this corruption to the freedom of eternal glory. And all of those meanings simultaneously are there in Exodus. And none of them takes away from any of the others. Moses really did lead the Israelites out of Egypt. And that really means all of these other things for us individually and for us collectively, politically. A, a bullet really did, a bullet that was in line for President Trump's head, really did miss his head and only took off part of his ear because he turned just a little bit right there at a rally in Pennsylvania. And what exactly that means, that, li- that literally happened, what exactly that means will, will become clearer w- with the retrospection of history. But, but, but what I can promise you is it does mean something. There's no member block today because I'm going to the RNC in Milwaukee. See you over there from the RNC. I'm Michael Knowles. This is the Michael Knowles Show. 